need you to respect the domain and space of those who do choose hijab. And in the West, the the woman in hijab is everywhere. And I say that, you know, she's the soccer mom, and she's the hockey mom, and she is the PTA mom, and she is parent-teacher mom in school involved. She can be at the board level. She can be an executive. She could be in... We even have police officers in the West who who um, observe hijab. She can, she's everywhere, and well, it kind of sounds like a endorsement for one of those credit cards. She's everywhere you want to be, but I believe that she is a symbol and a flagship. And just yesterday, as we were flying in to California, there was a girl in hijab sitting next to a gentleman, and the conversation ensued, and the conversation moved in the direction of Islam. We need to understand that non-Muslims in the non-Muslim world fears us. There's a real, real fear being built in the non-Muslim psyche. And hijab, when not used appropriately, um, does not help to uh, lessen that fear. And when used appropriately, is an incredible tool for opening doors and dialogue and for bringing understanding to this beautiful concept of modesty. <clears throat> then I end up closing the conversation on hijab <clears throat> and explain that hijab can vary from culture to culture because people are very confused by the dress codes. And while I am about to say something very, very controversial, I, I, I hope that you'll take this from me um, with great respect because it's a question that I get asked I am asked, is the niqab part of Islam? And what I mean by that is the face covering or or the whatever, the, the face in general. And my response to that is, while it has tremendous cultural value, that my personal understanding is that at least when we are in Hajj and we are circulating the most holy, holiest, place on earth for Muslims and doing the holiest of rites. Muslim women are not allowed to cover their face or their hands. And that is as far as I go with that response. I don't get into the culture or the different sects or is it haram and is it I don't do any of that. I just simply answer the question um, in, in a very non-controversial way and, and explain it um, that way. And then whatever choices people make about how they dress is, is their personal domain. So brothers and sisters, I hope that um, we will make space for not just what's on her head, but what's in her head, and to remember that it is as important to promote her humanness and to help bring her humanness forward. Um, and that... Um, I think we also need to acknowledge that not all of our brothers are biological maniacs who are just um, drooling at the mouth at the sight of a female. And that I also think it's important to note that there are many Muslim women who are not in hijab who carry themselves with a tremendous amount of modesty. I am personally telling you from my own experience that it is a position of empowerment, that it's a position of independence, that it's a position of um, leveling the playing field, that it's a position of equality, and that it has opened a tremendous amount of doors in terms of diversity and respect. I don't know that I could have gone this far had I not been in hijab. Allahu alam. But I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this concept of modesty. And in the West, again, um, I often say, Listen, folks, we don't have a problem with people who choose to take layers off. So let's not have a problem with people who choose to keep layers on. And then I follow that up with clothing is a very learned experience. For example, you would go to the beach and people would wear swimwear. But the swimwear that they wear at the beach is not at all what they would wear shopping in a mall. And so how is it, isn't it very fascinating and interesting that 
while the most minimum amount of clothing is on a beach and that is acceptable and it keeps getting skimpier and skimpier that in that setting there is a natural acceptance to that by the world but in the mall she wouldn't dress like that and she could actually be arrested and people would be going like this and turning their heads and saying is this woman crazy so what does that say that says that we have learned modesty and we have unlearned modesty and we are taught how to dress where to dress what to wear and what occasion what's appropriate what's not appropriate you know what I say to that that's a lot of work the thing that I love most about Islam is if I were to draw two circles and I do this in my lectures and I say to people here is the world stage and here is a lost stage on the world stage it's hard to compete. It's about what size you are. It's about what color you are. It's about how your hair is. It's about so much about the physical. What's in, what's out, what style tells you is so dictative. It dictates how you ought to be. And Allah's world for a woman and for a man, there isn't much... Um, World, there isn't much acceptance. You're accepted by Allah. And it, it, here there's a lot of comfort because it's not as important that someone dictate to you as in this circle what your level of acceptance is. The blueprint is there. We can adapt it, change it, vary it so that we're comfortable. But the bottom line is the blueprint is there. And so it's just a much easier stage to relax on and then lastly, I talk about the relationship of marriage. And isn't it really interesting that the world teaches us that we need to get dressed up to go outside on the world stage. We go to work, we go out, we look nice, put makeup on, do our hair, get dressed, so on and so forth, look sharp. And then when we come in the house, we are usually in our pajamas, looking awful, you know. Isn't that interesting? While the enhancement and the real beauty of Islam is about how beautiful do you look to your children? How beautiful do you look to your family? How beautiful can you really look inside and out to the people who love you? And where's the, where, where's the real value? You know, do, are we in a place and in a position where we can maybe reverse that a little bit or at least bring balance to it because the world expects a lot from all of us and it's very demanding. While I find that in Islam it's less demanding, more liberating and really enhances and, and speaks to who she is as a human being. So having said all that, brothers and sisters, I hope that um, while this has not been a scholarly discourse, that at least um, you will forgive me for things that I say, have said that you may not agree with, but that you would accept a perspective, and that I am pretty vast in my opinions about um, hijab. It's really, to me, about where this person is in their life, and if they choose hijab, can they uphold it appropriately? and can they maintain it and um, I want to also say to women don't be afraid to uh, to adapt your hijab so that it's still appropriate um, and, and, and that you still can look decent it's important for Muslims to look clean to look nice to look presentable obviously Imam, it's important Imam Jafar al-Sadiq in closing was asked he was asked by the people of his time, they say, they said, in Imam Jafar, you, you dress different than your father and your grandfathers have dressed. And he said, they dressed as the people of their time dress, and I dress as the people of my time dress. If we're just to isolate that and see what that means, that means that it's okay to dress within, within uh, the societal circles but cleanliness is a universal thing. And so it's never okay to be messy. It's never okay to smell.